Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of CCC Talks with Mark O'Loughlin and the Cloud Financial Council. Now, today we are joined by Barry Lalbrex, who is an independent business owner, software developer, architect, and Microsoft uh, MVP with a passion for the cloud. Barry, thank you so much for joining us on CCC Talks. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, having me. It's uh, it's an honor. Thanks very much. I hope we got the name right there. I think uh, close. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, pretty close. I usually don't even use it uh, when I uh, when I do anything, when I present. I just say, hey, I'm Azure Barry. You know, when I got married, my wife's name is actually Hannon. So we made the stupid mistake to not take that as our last name, which, you know, <laughs> because we, we do everything in English. We work in English and then we always yeah. have to say, hello, I'm Barry Leibrecht. And everybody's like, what? What are you saying? So, yeah, usually I just go by my moniker. Hey, I'm Azure Barry. And then. You know, people that, can. Uh, uh, go those from there. Can, can find you from that handle Azure Barry, which is very prolific, a lot of work done there. So, Barry, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing in the digital world. Yeah, I've uh, I've started out as a uh, developer, always very interested in uh, technology. Uh, now, actually, if I go a little bit more back, I got interested in technology because I was always uh, interested in things like electricity and how things work. So I used to just open things up. wasn't always able to put them back together, but that doesn't matter. I'm just interested in how things work, you know? I'm, I'm a puzzler. So moving on from there, I became a software developer, which is basically also solving puzzles, but then for companies, for money at, uh, at some point, I was being paid to actually do that. And I just got bitten by the bug, you know, you just, yeah. you type some text on a screen, you press a button and then something magical happens, you know, a user gets to see a button or has some value, or if it's really cool, something happens in the real world, like, I don't know, a light turns on or off or something more useful than that, you know? <laughs> so that was very cool. And I've always loved that. And from there, I grew further into roles like um, uh, software architect, uh, and also into more um, political roles, as in you can be a software architect that is very hands-on, but I've also mm -hmm. had software architect roles where I wasn't, where I was just mostly uh, busy creating diagrams and actually uh, trying to uh, get the, everything out of the way for the team to be able to do their work. So just dealing with politics from all sorts of other teams that might or might not also have mm -hmm. architects. And those things I did then from a freelance role because relatively early on I um, I became a freelancer because I started out in a consultancy company and then I thought you know what I can do this myself as well you know I know a lot of companies yeah. I can probably sell myself and you know worst case scenario if that doesn't work I can always you know go back to work somewhere else which yes. is not ideal but that's in the software industry that's basically the worst case scenario you can always get a job which is obviously a very privileged position to be in yes. because in most industries, that's not the case. But in our industry, uh, we still have a huge shortage of people and the demand keeps rising because still software is eating the world, which means that everything runs on software from your uh, washing machine. We just got a new washing machine. Now it's online. I have an app for my washing machine, which is yes. insane to you know everything that you do on your computer and everything you do on your phone my watch is also has lots of apps on it it's insane everything has apps which means that everything is software which means that for all these things we need people that write that software and there aren't uh, enough people to do that so we are in the extreme luxury position that we kind of always have a job especially if we're good at it and we have a bit, a bit of experience in it as well so yeah I, i've been going through that as a freelancer and uh, I never really had uh, I, I've never been anxious to uh, uh, not get a job and maybe you know yeah. be out of work or something yeah. and then you from the, there uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. and then from being a freelancer which in my case meant selling my time for for money basically on a one for one basis being an interim employee in many cases, which a lot of yes. freelancers do. And there's nothing wrong with that, absolutely not. But I wanted something more sustainable because when you trade your time for money, that means you can't scale because you know I only have a certain yes. amount of time to spend. Yeah. So I wanted to build on things like content. I've created a couple of books. 
uh, I now create a, a podcast as well, which doesn't make me any money, by the way, but it's just fun to do. And I've also created lots of courses, online courses for companies like Pluralsight. And those things scale because people can watch those courses while I'm not working on them. I just work on them once, I put them up, people can watch them, and then I can go on and do other stuff. That thing's scalable. So doing that, and then now additionally with consultancy to just add that on, means that I have a lot more freedom in my time and I get to choose a lot more where I spend my time. So I'm very happy with the results so far. Let's see where it gets me in the future. <laughs> it looks like it's going well. As I said, we've done some research on, on our guests like that. And you, you're, you're quite prolific. I think Agar Barry has, has quite a foothold there. You know the formula, once you're a freelancer or you work for yourself, the longer you do it, the less happy you will be going back to work for somebody else over time. But you've, you've a long time yet to go, which is good. Um, you mentioned there, I think it's interesting, um, a lot of work that you're in, so, uh, partly software development as well, that we don't have enough software developers. Um, yeah. I think that's an interesting thing. Is it because so many companies now require software? As you said, software is driving everything, it's eating the world. Uh, is it because we're not producing enough uh, through the various education systems or is it because people don't, not enough people are, gra are gravitating into the industry for some other reason? I think it's, uh, it's all of the above basically. So the demand is too high to keep up and we are simply not producing enough people, not in schools. I think the school system is uh, still a bit old school but also driving then the people to the educations that uh, end up in, in the software development career is, is difficult. Uh, especially, you know, there's lots of men. Like if you look at uh, my podcast, for instance, I really try to be diverse, but it's really difficult. It's yeah, mostly yeah. men and mostly white men, which is a problem. It's difficult to get uh, women and uh, minorities into software development for some reason. It's, it's not really clear to me why that is. Uh, it's also a cultural thing, of course, as yeah. in uh, we, we get that with our upbringing, you know, that uh, men are technical and women are not, which is really not true. <laughs> Absolutely not. But that it is a cultural thing and it's a bias that we all uh, grow mm -hmm. up with. So it's a very difficult thing to, uh, to turn around. So, so I, I guess that's part of it. But then on the other hand, uh, a lot of companies still require software engineers to have a formal uh, software education. So computer yeah. science education. And that's also a problem because there's lots of folks that uh, teach themselves because there's lots of resources online yeah. now. You can do a bootcamp, you can do lots of Pluralsight courses. There's uh, Microsoft Learn, lots of other companies have s similar things. You can teach yourself to code online, you can do that. You can have an online uh, internship and that's all fine, but that doesn't result in a, uh, an official degree. And that means that some bigger companies or some more old school companies don't hire you. So we keep then running into these shortages, but if we would open that up more, then I think we would uh, have a lot more very talented people that can actually enter the software industry. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point. As you said, the roots now for learning completely different to 20, 30 years ago. I think oh, yeah. even back in my day, you wanted to go into development, you learned a language or a particular language, maybe a couple, and the rest you learned as you went along based on an interest that you had. You know, but yeah. maybe that was a bit limiting. But the other thing I found as well, and probably still find is, and be interested in your views, when we teach the likes of a computer science or a language, um, we tend not to teach too much on the business aspect of what software development can achieve for an organization, competitive advantage, first time to market, all these other things, or even just staying within a market. Uh, you said if your competitor has now developed an app for the dishwasher or the appliance and you don't, you losing competitive advantage without even, you know, just, just overnight. Um, so do you think there's a gap as well in the business understanding in the software world for a lot of software developers that they purely look at it from a cold technical perspective or are they opening up their views now to be more business, you know, business focused or have business intuition? 
No, I think there's definitely a, a big gap in there, uh, especially if you look at uh, self-taught developers, for instance, they obviously focus on the technical side. They need yeah. to be capable technical, they have technical skills, but then they often lack the business uh, overall view of why the thing that you're doing is actually valuable to a customer. And yeah. you've seen it a lot within companies as well, where they have teams of developers, and most of these developers uh, just have their heads down, do their work, but don't really know what their business even does, how their yeah. company is making money, and how the thing that they're creating is actually making a difference. So if we would focus more on that, and that can be a responsibility for the companies as well, to educate their employees, to maybe spend some time, I don't know, a couple uh, days a month or something to take the people, and that's not only for developers, but for everybody that works at the company, to take them out to wherever the actual thing that they do happen. Let's say maybe it's in a factory or something. Take yeah. them out to see what actually happens on the floor, what the actual end result is, and what a customer does with it, because that creates actual context for what you're doing there, because maybe you're creating some forms over data thing that does some arbitrary uh, collection of data that you maybe I don't know it's a customer data that does something and then we put it in this pipeline and then some other team does something with it but at the yeah. end there's always somebody that has a product or a service and that that gets some value from it and if yeah. you don't understand what that is and how your company makes money from that then you don't have the context to make the right decisions okay. you yes. do have the context within your very small area of interest and then maybe your architect says, well, you know, we need to do this and this, and these are the boundaries within you can uh, basically color, uh, color in with your technical skills, you do your best. But that's that. I don't think that's what you want as a, as a software developer. At least I wouldn't want that. I can understand that some people just want to do their work, you know, and then they just go home and then that's fine. But if you get a bigger context of what you're actually doing and where you can provide more value, then you can also provide more value to your company. And I guess yeah. that ultimately results also for yourself in more satisfaction in your work and more value to the world and eventually in more opportunities within your company and outside of your company. I think that's, that's very true. I think it's, um, it, it's to move away from that commoditization of software development and the people that do software development, um, I think. Yeah. Very interesting. Now, Barry, you're also heavily involved in all things Microsoft, Azure, hence the name yeah. Azure, Barry. There was a little hint in there for me, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's a technology nail down, but tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that organiz organizations are facing with something as big and as ever changing as say Azure, what are some of the challenges people face with something like that? Well, if you look at uh, Azure, it was in beta in uh, 2008 and now we're in 2020. So yes. it's all relatively young still. You know, we, we, we now say in the software world, wow, that's a long time. That thing is, uh, is mature. It's as mature yeah. as it can get. But you know, it's really not, it's just, it's 12 years, it's nothing really. But yeah. uh, if you look at Azure, it is a, like you said, it is huge. It is so big. It's the same like uh, Amazon Web Services, for instance, and Google Cloud is getting there as well. They yeah. are very big. They offer many, many services that do all sorts of stuff. Like Azure has, I don't know, 160 different services and products within the whole Azure sphere that yeah. do all sorts of things. Now, the, the challenge that companies usually had when they, uh, we're going to the cloud or we're thinking of going to the cloud was, hey, uh, this is not safe because now uh, I need to trust Microsoft or Amazon with the security of all my data and all my applications. Yeah. I don't want to do that because I know that these four guys that sit there in my server room, I trust them. I know them. We've been to dinner. I know their wives and uh, kids. And so, you know, they do a good job. They, they stay late. Uh, and if something happens, they always... Uh, they always do their work. I trust yeah. them more with my data than I trust Microsoft. That was, I don't know, up until five years ago, that was the biggest problem. But I think basically due to marketing efforts that changed a lot, and also because of lots of uh, data breaches that uh, smaller companies now have, it's much more prolific and it gets on the news. You don't want to get on the news with a data breach because that means your company is in big, big trouble. Yes. It's going to cost you a lot of money and lots, lots of reputation. 
So I think many companies now have realized, well, we better trust something like Microsoft to handle our data and our applications uh, for security because these guys have scale. These guys have been working on these problems for decades, not, not only within the cloud, but you know, remember Hotmail, for instance, MSN, all that stuff. That, those yeah. were also cloud services. Microsoft has been running that uh, for, for ages, for decades, literally. So I think companies have come around to the notion that uh, uh, trusting a big company with your data is uh, better, at least for now, than uh, doing that, uh, all keeping it all in your own data center and having your own team deal with that because you simply can't keep up with the changing pace of technology yeah. and you, you just don't have the tools for it and don't have the data for it. Now, now that's one. I think the biggest um, challenge now is the breadth of services. So how many services there are. So yeah. when companies come to the cloud, they don't know where to start really. They're like, well, what do we do first? We, because their application landscape usually is huge and complex. They might have, I don't know, hundreds of virtual machines running. And within those virtual machines, there are many, many services that are yeah. web applications, desktop applications, databases, APIs, all sorts of background things and legacy Windows processes running all over the place. What do you do first and where do you get the value from? And how do you make sure that you don't start paying way too much for just being in the cloud, whatever value yes. that, uh, yeah. that gives you then? So what then usually happens is they start by lifting and shifting applications or v virtual machines to virtual machines in the cloud. So you change where it runs basically. And that means yeah. that it's, you, you get a lot of value from that already because uh, Azure and AWS as well and Google Cloud, they all then manage that VM so that make, they make sure that the thing keeps up and running. They have their availability and that is way better than your own data center. And I'm sure your own data center is, is way cool and you've got your stuff sorted, but you just can't compete with the scale and efficiency of these big players. They have data centers all over the world they have all these experiences with cooling, electricity, redundancy, all that type of stuff. Security, physical security of the data centers, logical security. You just, you can't do it yourself. Yeah. So that's usually the first thing that they do. And then after that, the big challenge is, well, what do we do next? Is, is this good enough? <laughs> or do we now refactor all of our applications and then get that web application out of there and put it somewhere in a different service and at which service should we take it all out and create microservices applications yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever what the trend. Do do? yeah containers isn't it, um, isn't it a challenge though that a lot of organizations in there you know are driven maybe by a cloud first approach or um company x is doing it so we must do it moving as you said applications and vms into the cloud and now they're having the challenge, what do we do next and so far as, um, you know, uh, do we do all these things you mentioned? But shouldn't really the approach have been, what's the value of moving into the cloud and what's the value to the organization? So, okay, if you've moved stuff in, surely the next question is, let's pause for a moment. Let's figure out if we do these things like microservices or refactor or whatever we want to do, let's understand what it does for the organization from a value position first of all before we go on the technological journey because we may not yeah. need to refactor all these applications absolutely and, and that first step is usually driven by hey we have a, our own data center or our own server somewhere and now we need to buy new ones in a couple of years what do we do yeah. Yeah. so when you come to that decision then usually somebody says hey we need to go to the cloud because we're not we don't want to invest in another data center or another hardware there yeah. which then makes sense from a financial perspective so that's the first yes. value that you get already and then the next value indeed then you should start actually thinking about well, what do you do next and where is the next value uh, in that what often happens is unfortunate and that's that uh, i don't know either the cto or uh, the higher ups in the technical organization, they are, they, they've gone to conferences, they've seen all the cool new tech and they wanna do all the hip yeah. new things because it's cool. And also, you know, they wanna keep their uh, technical staff happy and challenged with cool new things, which is understandable, but usually it doesn't provide the value. So for instance, mm -hmm. if you have uh, an application 
that's working fine you know it's running in a vm or something totally fine but then there's sometimes little benefit especially if you don't change the application a lot there's a little benefit in getting that application out of there maybe putting it in a container uh, cutting it up into microservices and doing all sorts of stuff to it because that adds complexity what you rather would do is then i don't know make that uh, virtual machine highly available make sure to use all the power of the cloud to keep that thing secure uh, as cheap as possible scalable and highly available and that's it don't touch it anymore leave it there yeah. and then for new stuff you can think about using all the new things all the new technologies and that's where the added value is because then you can start using for instance these uh, software as a service uh, ai services that uh, come with pre-trained uh, uh, models for instance to do uh, i don't know um, text to speech to do uh, image recognition all that type of stuff then you can start thinking about that as new services that you might add on to uh, already existing applications like uh, i don't know a chatbot that you add to a website or something like that that then adds value to whatever you already have but that doesn't mean that you have to change your existing thing completely and yes. you know muck it up and add complexity to there but that's yeah. that's a common mistake that happens and it's understandable yeah. but that usually ends up in a year long project that costs way too much and might even end up in a complete rewrite because you know it wasn't really feasible anyways and then that comes negatively back on the IT department or the IT folks at the end of the day because the thing will or the blame will come back to them or well we didn't get the value we spent all this money we've had to refactor those decisions so to try and get ahead of it first of all i think lead with the value the technology is there as you said it's plug and play then the SaaS, the apis yeah. you can all plug and play into generally what you have rather than refactoring everything for the cloud so maybe further analysis on the existing it and applications you have but certainly for anything new go to with a cloud mentality and see what benefits can we get here and then plug and play the the, the rest of it are there challenges um, facing, I guess, uh, people with Azure? So we have a lot of technologists from the last 20, 30, even 40 years or so familiar with a more traditional model of IT, and now we're in this cloud model. Are they, uh, have they embraced it finally? Are they still holding out? Is there a bit of a mixed uh, challenge going on there? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we're getting there. I think, uh, especially, in, uh, well, let's say five years back, especially 10 years back, you saw a big divide between developers and uh, I like to call them IT pros. Nowadays, yes, you might call yes. yourself a DevOps professional or, or something yes, like that, operational yes. professional. But back then, there was a big divide where developers were very keen to uh, get on the cloud because then they could use all the new and latest and greatest things, which basically yes. meant they had to program less because most of the plumbing would be done for you yes, and yes. so you can just focus on the actual application adding value where the IT people obviously they would then uh, give away responsibility so things servers that they used to manage that they wouldn't have to manage that anymore or a database that you would be a database administrator of which means you all day you spent on uh, improving performance watching the logs see what happens all that type of stuff, all done for you by the cloud. Yeah, the cloud is very yeah. clever at them, which left them in a position where they thought, well, what about me? Am I going to lose my job now? Do you even need me anymore? Well, the answer is yes, we definitely do need you because yeah. in the cloud also things need to be deployed. But your, your tasks, it, it's just different. Your work just shifts. Instead of managing the infrastructure, and you can still manage infrastructure because you still have virtual machines and uh, yeah. virtual networks, IP addresses, all that stuff. But instead of managing that on a very detailed level down to the server itself, you let part of the stack be handled by something like Azure or Amazon. Uh -huh. And you, as an infrastructure professional, you focus also more on delivering value. For instance, on creating scripts that then can automatically deploy let's say the the development environment or a test environment or automatically without you creating virtual machines by hand and then configuring them and yeah. making sure yeah. that they have all the bits and pieces on them you can just script all that stuff now 
and then you can put that in um, in a DevOps environment like Microsoft has Azure DevOps and there's lots more of these types of environments where you can then take these scripts and have those deployed automatically and then get your application built and compiled automatically have that deployed automatically and that whole pipeline is also something that the IT pros would then uh, manage and that can be very complicated as well but it's lots of new stuff that they had to learn but I think now we see that uh, that they really came up to speed also because they had to lots of companies have gone to the cloud regardless yeah. of what the IT pros thought which means that you either learn and play along or find another job basically that's an interesting phrase and i think it is the reality of where we are uh, learn and as you said play along and get along or find another job but that another job is being moved to the cloud as well that eventually they will all be displaced so you're going to have to learn and get along or there might not be a role there and i think it's more challenging today but we do have to adapt because the cycle time of technology is so short these days. Years ago, we could get a career for 40 years before the next technology came in. As you said, what was in Azure beta in 2008 it looks nothing like it today with the 160 or so applications and all the other services that are available in Azure. So I think we, we have to do that. All right, in 2017, sorry, um, you wrote a book that was called, uh, it's good to lead in here, The Developer's Guide to Microsoft Azure. It's following on from what you're talking. And in it, you talk about plan better, code together, and ship faster with Azure. I think some of, some of the comments you've mentioned there. Now, really, is it that simple these days, or is there a catch? <laughs> <laughs> so can we never... plan better? hold together and ship faster with Azure. Simple, done, let's move on. So what do you think? If you think about it from a high level, then yes. You know, Azure uh, and also the other clouds, uh, they all make our lives easier yeah, because yeah. they just manage more of the plumbing, basically. Like yeah, I said, yeah. they just do all of the, the low level stuff that nobody wants to do. You don't want to manage a VM and make sure that it's uh, up and running. You just want to deploy yeah. that thing and, and let the platform worry about that type of stuff. Yeah. So. So I think it it is it can be that simple, uh, but obviously there is lots of details, and there is, for instance, the detail of costs as well, <laughs> because all of that works very well. Uh, but then uh, you know you get a credit card bill at the end of the month, and it can be extremely high. That's also a challenge in the cloud as well, because you know things run. Uh, you pay for things that run. You always yeah. done that, but then you you already paid for the servers, and uh, you know, so you already spent yeah. your money. But now you yeah. spend that type of money, you smear it out over the year. Uh, every month you pay a bit more, and if you uh, are unlucky, one of your developers, for instance, spun up a Kubernetes uh, cluster somewhere, left it running, and then uh, it becomes extremely expensive very quickly. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So it can be very simple. It depends on the plans that you make. Like we talked about earlier, it, it's very easy to fall into the trap that you just um, cloudify your applications, your existing infrastructure, because yeah. it's cool and it's a fun thing to do. But from the top down, from the CTO or CEO even down, there needs to be a very, very clear strategy and uh, a vision first, a vision of where do you want to go with this yeah. whole digital transformation, as in where do we want to be in five years? Do we want uh, all of our current applications to still be up and running, for instance. Maybe we want to prune them, see what we actually need. Maybe we want to automate other processes that aren't automated right now. Yeah. Maybe we can then, you know, replace uh, some of the people uh, by automated processes, which obviously is not a nice thing to do, but that's just how it works nowadays to make business more efficient. You know? it, it is, but if people look at it, they say, let's, I mean, don't this in uh, manufacturing for years. We've automated the manufacturing of most products, but people have moved into services. Now I think yes. uh, on a recent broadcast we spoke about, now we're automating services and we're migrating people into the knowledge economy, into knowing yeah. how my plumbing works, but not really caring about the pipes and the fittings and all that somebody else does. So I think it's a natural migration of us now from manufacturing from services into this knowledge economy driven driven by cloud. I think we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should, we should be open to it. 
um, in whatever role we, we have in this, this, this technolo technological or digital um, challenge that's, that, that, that we face. Yeah, I totally agree. So we will be the people that uh, know how to tie all the things that already work together. So yes, we are yes. service integrators, basically, API yes, integrators. Yes. Yes. And, you know, eventually what I used to do as an architect, where I just draw a box, so this is service A and this is service B, and they talk to each other and the information flow goes that way. Yes. Maybe at some point that diagram will be just deployed to the cloud and then that just actually works. And I don't care how it works as long yes. as I've just integrated that and know what the value is that comes out of that integration. Yeah. So yeah. Th that might be the future. And you see that also in the low code platforms, for instance, Microsoft has the power platform where business users, they can just uh, throw together an application. They can just drag and drop buttons and text fields and stuff. And that just yes. works without them knowing how it works, without them programming even. And that can sometimes be enough to have a simple forms over data thing where they just collect data and it spits out something else, which, which is and most applications. Yeah, and, and if it works well, if it's simple to use, uh, business people have seen use that platform to develop some logic, some forms, and they go good enough for what we want to do. And because businesses are changing how they deal with customers, they don't need applications that last for 10, 20 years. They need something to do with business transaction for today maybe tomorrow yeah. a couple of weeks this year next year it will change because we have the technology to do so many different things so we need to be able to be adaptable to it and we don't need this very cumbersome difficult way of coding these days drag and drop players are becoming i think uh, quite the norm in addition to a lot of the the, the SaaS that's out there um yeah. Barry, yeah. you have a very interesting podcast yourself the developer weekly podcast tell us a little bit about that and what you cover in in, in your own show yeah well thanks for mentioning that that's actually uh, that's really uh, a passion pro project of mine i mentioned it earlier it's uh, it's not something i make money with absolutely not it just costs money because i just keep buying uh, equipment and gear to make it sound better yeah but yes. um, what it's about it's a, it's a podcast for uh, developers architects basically for software professionals of uh, of all calibers or so beginners uh, to experts um, and what i cover there is uh, is technology uh, topics so sometimes very specific things like about microservices for instance yes. but sometimes yes. also about how to troubleshoot or um, what uh, neurodiversity looks like within the software industry so people that have autism, for instance, what, how does it look like and, and how do we deal with uh, stuff like that? So it, I try to make it not a typical podcast, a technology podcast where we talk about the latest and greatest JavaScript framework of the week, but more <laughs> something that has uh, more value where we have uh, conversations that matter basically yeah, with, yeah. Uh, with people that are interesting and know their stuff. So I've been lucky so far that I had uh, lots of uh, industry uh, leaders on the podcast and there's a lot more to come as well this year and right. the beginning of next year as well all scheduled but it's lots that's, of fun yeah, yeah it's so it's good. and it's weekly and um, that's good that's good i think it's a good approach it's more sounded like it's a value-driven human side of technology which yeah. i think is where technology is going it's not about the technology anymore you said the plumbing is taken care of it's about the human side and uh, the value side you mentioned something earlier, Barry, about costs. I was going to ask you about challenges, but that's one challenge maybe we'll drill into a little bit. Um, a lot of organizations have now realized on their cloud journey or cloud migration that uh, costs went increased and continue to increase for some reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knew? And then you also talk about having a vision and a strategy. So sometimes what's happened is the vision was let's go into cloud. The strategy was just migrate in. Then now we've got these bigger costs than we expected. Now let's re-strategize and figure out why and what we do about it. And cost has been a big thing. What's your experience with organizations? Have they come to realize the cost challenge after they've gone into cloud and after they've experienced it? And then what have, what have they done or what are they doing to try and understand the game control again? Of cost, cost is important. Yeah, usually uh, they uh, discover costs 
after they have gone into the cloud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's often that is because they don't understand what kind of things cost money in the cloud. For instance, yeah. uh, a cloud provider usually charges you for data that goes out of cloud data centers. Yes. That is egress data. So for yeah. instance, um, if I have a website and you go to it, you download the HTML of that website and the images and whatever else is on there. And then I pay for that traffic that goes out of the data center there. And that can become a huge cost, especially yes. if you, uh, for instance, have uh, storage, you, you store data there and you just download it uh, to your company. Let's say you just use this as as uh, as a shared uh, data store where you just store your your uh, I don't yeah. know your word documents or something. That can be very expensive. So once people realize that, then they can find a solution for that. For instance, if you were using a cloud storage account to store just documents and then use those on your local PC, maybe you should have a VPN to your cloud, and then you don't have those costs anymore because then that's yeah. one thing. You're in the same network, basically. Yes. That's, so that's those are. I think, yeah. I think that's a good tip. That's a very good tip for anybody listening <laughs> in. If you haven't done that, have a look at it. It's a simple, easy thing. There is lots more uh, tips and tricks, but it's usually just um, getting to know what things cost money in the cloud and how yeah. to actually work with the cloud, because the cloud has, has different paradigms, yeah, like scaling, yeah. for instance. You can scale out, but the power of the cloud is that you can scale in. So mm -hmm. if you have a virtual machine that runs an application, that thing is by default, that thing is on 24-7. Yes. But the chances are that you do not need that VM to be running 24-7. So you can create rules or whatever, a schedule that just powers that uh, virtual machine down in the weekend or, I don't know, in the evening or whenever you don't need it. or based on a rule where it measures if it's actually being used and then scale it down. So yeah. if you actually apply all those rules, which is different, difficult because it's not in your mindset because you never had these paradigms. But yes. if you apply these rules, then you can save a lot of costs. And the same goes for using the right pricing tiers. People don't realize usually that they uh, use higher pricing tiers, which means uh, higher and more processing power than they actually need. So if you scale to the right pricing tiers, then usually you can also save lots and lots of costs. So I like, like that. Two tips are scale in. Everybody's talking about scale out, scale up, scale everything, but scale in and scale right when you think about the tiers. And that should be focus organizations on at least cost savings initially. And I think the architecture as well, you can architect for x amount of redundancy and availability but do you need all of that sometimes you do and that's where the costs come in and you have to accept those costs because you want that higher level of availability which is fine but then scale in and scale right and save cost elsewhere where you need it fantastic but i can ask um azure is fairly technologically focused you know um technologists developers and architects all love this but within organizations do does anybody else care about Azure um, in so far as having business conversations about the cloud and the likes of Azure, how it can help uh, business functions? Or is there still a divide between the technologists who develop in Azure and use them and, and do, the, do the plumbing parts and the business? Is there a big divide or is that slowly closing now? That business are understanding the power of Azure and what to do with it? It is slowly closing, and that's uh, mainly due to Microsoft's uh, incredibly big marketing machine, because you know Azure is now their primary business. That's how they make yes. money. They don't make yeah. money from Office or Windows anymore. It's it's Azure. That's what uh, their money maker. So they're pouring all of their resources in marketing it, educating customers uh, about it, and uh, developing and expanding it, which then means that at the the C level in within a company, people know what Azure is. People obviously know what Microsoft is, but then yes. uh, people there also start to realize that my, Azure and accompanying cloud services like Office 365, and there is also uh, Dynamics, uh, the CRM business, all those oh, things, yes. they all tie together with each other. And then things like OneDrive and all these different mm -hmm. cloud uh, uh, venues, they all tie together to uh, 
enable your digital transformation within your company. And so Azure is just a part of that because you know productivity suite, for instance, uh, Office 365, where you have your email, your, your word processing, your PowerPoint, all that type of stuff is extremely important because email, you can't live without email, for instance, in a company or uh, Teams nowadays has exploded yeah. as well. All that ties into Azure as well, where then Azure gets sold as the, the thing where there you can do customizations of all these things that you see here. You can build custom uh, versions of that with Azure, where you can uh, use uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these clever things and run your existing applications as well. So I think the value proposition for Azure and the other cloud services for Microsoft is very clear to uh, to basically all levels of uh, of the organizations nowadays, that, at least that I speak to. And also, city. yeah, and also how that then relates to, uh, let's say the competition. So uh, Amazon Web Services and uh, Google Cloud as well, where at least in the Netherlands, you see that Microsoft is extremely prevalent. That's due to their marketing efforts here as well and their sales effort. But I think it's also because uh, Amazon, for instance, is a huge company that does all sorts of stuff. They also sell books and audio books and uh, everything else that you can imagine on their website. And their cloud business is a big business, but it's not their primary focus per se. Where for Microsoft, it's their one thing. It's the one thing that they do, basically. They do lots yeah. of other smaller things as well, but this is what drives their company is if Azure fails, Microsoft fails. Microsoft stops yeah. existing at the moment. It's amazing, it's amazing where we've got, and I always think it's uh, amazing that where we are today in this cloud world was not, everything in IT was disrupted by an online bookstore originally. The ADU <laughs> a bookstore, an online bookstore got us here, which is fantastic because of the changes in jobs and roles and technology and everything else, which is really, really good to see. We are in this transformation you know this uh, this new world and it's going to be i think part of such surmountable change going on i think it's really good barry we're going to finish up with a few final questions very quick questions and uh, short answers i think on this we mentioned a little bit about digital, digital transformation i didn't go down that rabbit hole today we, we could be here for an entire day on that but very briefly, do you think, or from what you see, is digital transformation generally misunderstood in the marketplace at the moment? Uh, yes, I think so. <laughs> I think that that's the case. It's it's still a hype word, digital yes. transformation. It's actually two words where people think, oh, we have to transform our complete business so that everything is digital, which the, the, the literal interpretation of most businesses, yeah. which yeah. obviously is not the case. Yeah. What is the case is that you need to enable your teams and your people and your customers with digitalization, which doesn't mean digitize everything, but maybe just those places where it makes sense and it makes work. And that yeah. ties back into what I said earlier, you need to come up with a proper vision and then a strategy to execute on that vision, which is the most difficult thing obviously to do as a company because that makes or breaks your company. But if you don't do that right, also, your digital transformation doesn't go right. And you can say, well, I'm hiring Microsoft or Amazon to do my digital transformation for me. That doesn't work because you have to come up with what you want first. That's fantastic advice. We're, we'll certainly go ahead and recapture that. I think that's really, really good advice. Uh, another question, moving to, we've kind of covered on this, but let's, let's get it short on this. Moving to the cloud should save an organization lots of money. It can. But it usually doesn't because organizations have no idea what they are actually running. So, for instance, they might have 100 applications that are hidden on their servers right now <laughs> that also need to go to the cloud. And once they are in the cloud, then yeah. they need to be in their own containers or virtual yeah. machines where they yeah. are, where they have all the abilities, the availability, security, performance, yeah. all that stuff, because it's a performance, it's a... Uh, it's a production application, and so it needs to be treated yeah. as such, where now it is some hidden thing that runs somewhere on the server that nobody thinks about, but is might be critical to the business. So usually when you then discover that there are 10 of those things on a virtual machine, you probably split those out and that costs you more money. 
But in reality, you should have already done that. And so you should have already paid that money. But it's just because now you're looking at your infrastructure and your application landscape that uh, you start realizing what you have and that will cost you money. So in general, yeah. for people that move to the cloud, initially, no, it doesn't save you money. But uh, the costs that you make start being more realistic. That's what I would say. I think that that's reality that people are seeing that. Similar vein, similar type of question, but um, we'll try this. Moving IT budgets from this CapEx to this OpEx model is a good thing? Absolutely. Yeah, you don't want to own stuff anymore. You just want to lease or rent it, basically, because that means that you can also turn it down. Like we said, you can scale down yeah. and that or turn it off uh, as well. You know, your service might not be used over the summer holidays, for instance, yeah, where that yeah. server that you have, if it's not used over the summer holidays, it's still there and you still pay for it. So it's good. absolutely so a good thing. Turn off, scale down, scale right would be a model yeah. to uh, to use there. Final question, DevOps. You kind of mentioned a little bit on DevOps. Again, we could be here for a day on that. We might come <laughs> back and do that again. Yeah. DevOps is solved with cloud-based tools. What do you think? Wh what was that? Yeah, DevOps is solved with cloud services, cloud-based tools. Oh, no, absolutely not. No, DevOps is not about tools. DevOps is about people. Yeah, I know it's simple. <laughs> it's but... very, and DevOps is actually very simple. It, it's, it's just what the name says. It's developers and operations people working together. That's all that it is. Because traditionally, operations people and de uh, developers have different goals. Developer wants yeah. to change things and operations people want to keep yeah, everything the same. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can work together on changing things because you need to change things to add value, then you yeah. have DevOps and then you can work together and add value. That's really interesting. And I think for me, DevOps has come about because of cloud technologies, because we can change things in an instant now. The need to develop in production almost uh, is there but then you need operations to make sure that it all works together. The only way you can do that is to get everybody working on the same goal rather than, which I think is what DevOps is really about, rather than using tools to make changes quickly, things like that. Yeah, but tools uh, do help because, you know, do. previously uh, deployments were very scary. You had uh, Word documents that you need to go yeah. line by line. And yeah. now you have that in, in an automated pipeline. So every deployment is exactly the same which means that you can also uh, revert them if you need to yes, so tools yes. help but it's it's definitely about the people yeah it's about the people good Barry, we're going to finish up but any final words or any other insights on what's coming next in azure who what's coming next in azure well i think uh, existing <laughs> existing services will obviously uh, evolve and uh, everything becomes cheaper. If you look at uh, storage, for instance, in the cloud, it's not only for Azure, but in other, other vendors as well, it becomes cheaper and cheaper every year. And that's because of scale. The more people that use it, the more scale they have and the more cheap it gets. The same goes for compute as well. We get more compute, you know, eventually we might be able to use uh, quantum computers in the cloud mm -hmm. as well. Still yeah. a ways away, but that will be very interesting. Yeah. And I think uh, we will see a lot more as a service services. Like um, in the beginning, we saw a lot of infrastructure as a service where you had a lot of control, but also a lot of responsibility yourself. Yeah. And now you do see that customers also, they, they want to use things that are managed by a cloud provider. So Azure also, they have lots of uh, those services, for instance, in the form of uh, artificial intelligence services mm -hmm. that come with yeah. pre-trained models that you can just use out of the box to do image recognition and things like that. So you yeah. don't have to do all that yourself because you know um, machine learning is difficult and AI is, is difficult okay. because you need data scientists and it's all very complicated. Yeah. But big companies like Microsoft do that themselves. And I think the next step is also that they do it in verticals. Like they now provide uh, specific services, for instance, for the uh, autonomous vehicles market, which is very interesting or for the uh, the farming market as well. Yes, yes, so yes. So if, if you're in one of these verticals, then you can just use a couple of these services and build tire your application together instead of having to train all that data yourself and spend millions on very complicated yes, processes. Yes. So they're gonna en enable all that stuff for you. 
I think that's fantastic insight. And I think it links back to one of your uh, earlier comments was, even though, for example, Azure has been around now for the 12 years or so, um, it's only started. That's yeah. no time at all. Even though developers say, oh, 12 years, it's, it's only getting started now and they can only grow and grow into verticals, into solving solutions that businesses plug into the as a service and then develop around the edges for what they need. Uh, which yeah. I think is really interesting to do. And it's, it's one to watch, especially in the large public cloud providers. Barry, we're going to finish up. Barry Lauber, thank you so much for joining us on CCC Talks today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was, uh, was a blast. Let's do it again. <laughs> we should do. We should do. Thank you, Barry. All right. Thank you.